a season filled with panic, fear, strife, concern, and yet Mark Few and the Gonzaga Bulldogs earn a five seed in Salt Lake City where they will take on a 30-win McNeese State team. Who could have seen this coming? And can the Zags keep that Sweet 16 streak alive? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Sunday. Happy Monday to those of you listening the next day. Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's Selection Sunday episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, the Zags are five seed. So much emotion throughout the season. Will the Zags even make the NCAA tournament? Is the Sweet 16 streak going to end? We already saw the AP Top 25 streak end back in January. Losses were piling up. They weren't getting the quad one victories. And yet Mark Few continued to tell us to calm down. He got a little testy about it towards the end of the year, started calling bracketologists amateurs who didn't know what they were talking about. And maybe he was right because every bracketologist Every projection, everything out there indicated that maybe the best case scenario for the Gonzaga Bulldogs was a six seed. And yet, Selection Sunday rolls around. The Zags get a five seed in the Midwest region, where not only do they get a five seed, which was higher than everybody projected they would potentially land, they get a five seed where they get to play in Salt Lake City. That is a great regional draw. They did not get the five seed in Spokane, which is not surprising. They don't typically give teams that kind of home court advantage. They did, however, put St. Mary's in Spokane, which I thought was funny. That's perhaps a a bit of a disadvantage for the Gales as they'll take on a a Grand Canyon team. We'll talk about that uh, a bit later. But Gonzaga gets to go to Salt Lake. They get to play as a five seed. They get to play in a region, which we'll discuss later, that I think could be potentially advantageous for the Zags. We didn't see this coming, and yet the committee really clearly valued where Gonzaga's resume was. They valued the late season push. They valued the the fact that they ended up getting ultimately up to those three quad one wins. Makes you start to wonder if they beat St. Mary's, could they have even climbed into the four seed conversation? That felt just unattainable or unattainable at all throughout the season, and yet it seems like they may have been pretty close to being in that conversation. Now, We're going to have a lot more about the individual matchup. We'll have a whole show dedicated to McNeese State, so Will Wade. We're going to talk about them a little bit here, uh, but we're going to talk much more about that. We're also going to talk about the overall region for for the Zags, some other bubbly stuff, some teams that got left out, uh, some other teams that Gonzaga played, and we're going to laugh at BYU not getting a a seat as high as Gonzaga or St. Mary's. We're also going to close out the show actually talking about a couple of transfer portal targets that Gonzaga is, is eyeballing because if the Gonzaga coaching staff has to focus on the transfer portal and the NCAA tournament at the same time, in solidarity, I will do the same, and we'll also talk about the transfer portal while talking about the NCAA tournament as well. But here we are. Gonzaga's taking on McNeese State, the Cowboys, uh, in the Southland Conference. They went 30-3 and three this season. They went 17-1 and one in conference play. Uh, they had some solid non-conference wins. Uh, they beat VCU out of the A-10, who almost won the auto bid out of that conference. They beat Michigan, a win that certainly did not age particularly well, as Michigan floundered significantly in the Big and ultimately recently let go of head coach Juwan Howard. They did beat UAB, who actually beat VCU for that A-10, or excuse me, they they won the AAC, uh, UAB did. So that's the only tournament team that McNeese beat this season is UAB. And UAB made the NCAA tournament about an hour before Selection Sunday happened because they won that conference. If they had not won that last game in the AAC, they would not be dancing. So I think that is an important note to make about this team. People are going to look at this and say, holy crap, they're 30 and three. Holy crap. They're coached by Will Wade, who led uh, LSU to like a 25 and five season a few years ago. That's a tough matchup. And you know what? Yeah. Five twelves are typically pretty tough. 
There's a reason they have a lot of upsets in that area. But this team has not played anybody as good as Gonzaga this year. And I think that's an important note to make. Now, again, we talked about Will Wade. He's won about 70% of the career games that he has coached. He coached at Chattanooga. He coached at VCU. He coached at LSU. And now he's at McNeese. He got fired at LSU because of an FBI probe uh, indicated that he was uh, – paying some players, things that are now legal in college basketball. It's a bit of a, and he's kind of one of the last coaches to really get hammered uh, from a punishment perspective for something that is now not even against the rules. Uh, so that was an interesting thing. He got suspended for the first 10 games this season at McNeese. They played really well without him. They played even better once he got back into the mix. They're the 61st ranked team at Ken Palm. Borderline top 50 team, 51st, uh, 85th defensively. They're slowing it down, 282nd in tempo. Again, we'll get much more into the McNeese State-specific matchup. It's going to be on Thursday as I'm recording right now. I don't know what time, but we will talk more about that individual matchup. Keys to a victory for Gonzaga, what they need to do, who needs to step up, et cetera, et cetera. But what I want to do now is look at the rest of the region for Gonzaga. Because the winner of the Gonzaga-McNeese State game will play the winner of the 4 verse 13 game. That is Kansas, Bill Self's Jayhawk squad versus a 13 seed Samford. Kansas has eight losses in the Big 12. This is the least successful Kansas team in Big 12 conference play under Bill Self. Been there for 20 years. Part of that is the you know addition of teams like Houston and to an extent like BYU and Cincinnati who crushed Kansas in the Big 12 tournament. Part of that was also that Kansas was missing Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCollar, and Kansas only has four good players. This is the issue with the Jayhawks. They have four good players. Hunter Dickinson's their starting center. KJ Adams, their starting power forward. Kevin McCollar, their do-it-all starting three. Dewan Harris, their starting point guard. Shooting guard has been a huge issue for Kansas all year long, and they have virtually no bench depth. Now, Johnny Furphy, freshman from Australia, who Gonzaga was pursuing last offseason, he has stepped up and been a good player for Kansas for the last month-ish of the season. Still inconsistent, but when he's on, he's on. El Marco Jackson, another freshman, has not stepped up. Nick Timberlake, uh, transfer from Towson, he has been pretty bad. Their only other semi-rotation player is Parker Braun, who actually played at Santa Clara last year, transferred to Kansas. Uh, he's the older brother of Christian Brown, who's now in the NBA with the Denver Nuggets. So this is not the Kansas teams of old. This is not the Kansas team uh, that won it all a couple of years ago. This is not a typical Kansas team. They may not get by Samford, who's a pretty good team, 15-3 and three in the Southern League. Uh, really, really good offense. They have kind of a unique setup the way that they run it. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if Samford is the team that advances past Kansas. Uh, and if Gonzaga beats McNeese, they may get a chance to play a Samford team as opposed to Kansas. But still, if it is Kansas... If Dickinson and McCullough are out, that's a huge advantage for Gonzaga. If they're not out, if they both play, that's still a really good Kansas team. They're not great. They're not as good as Kansas teams of the past. But Hunter Dickinson and K.J. Adams can absolutely neutralize Graham E.K. Could be a tough matchup for Gonzaga. Looking at the rest of the bracket, your one seed is Purdue. So if Gonzaga advances past McNeese and past either Kansas or Samford, they will play Purdue in the, in the Sweet 16 unless – Somebody else beats Purdue. We'll get to that momentarily. Your two seed is Tennessee. Rick Barnes' squad, fantastic this year. Three seed is Creighton. If things line up perfectly, Gonzaga and Creighton could meet in the Elite Eight, a Ryan Nemhard reunion-type game of sorts. Uh, Kansas, your four. Gonzaga, your five. South Carolina, out of the SEC, is your six seed. Lamont Paris, coach of the year for leading a team that was expected to finish last in the SEC to a six seed in the big dance. Texas is your seven seed. I thought they were a little overseeded, but that's just me. Your 8-9 matchup is Utah State versus TCU. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those teams, whoever wins, gives Purdue some serious run for their money in that second round game. Uh, then we got Virginia and Colorado as a play-in game for the 10 seed. Winner of that game will play Texas. Oregon, the winner of the Pac-12, they get an 11 seed to take on South Carolina. McNeese, the 12, 13 is the Samford. 14, Akron, the Zips, they only won their spot in the, in the tournament because Kent State player, I feel so bad for him if you guys didn't see this. He, they... Kent State scored to take a one-point lead. There was like two two or three seconds left. They inbounded the ball. The Kent State player thought that they needed to foul. Fouled, put a player from Akron on the line. He hit the two free throws. That's how Akron won and made it into the NCAA tournament. Devastating for Kent State. Akron now gets a chance to take on Creighton. 15 seed is the Peacocks of St. Peter's, who made that miracle run to the Elite Eight. They were a 15 seed that time, and they started it off with a win over an SEC team in Kentucky. Can they do it again against Tennessee? We will see. Your 16 seeds are a play-in game between Montana State in the Big Sky and Grambling. 
That is who is going to be in the region for Gonzaga. Tough teams. Purdue, Tennessee is very tough at the top. I think Creighton's a potential Final Four team. But for Gonzaga, again, we're not going to nitpick the region when they got a five seed and they get to play in a fairly regional location in Salt Lake City. And look, this is a kind of a, a crazy fact I didn't know. The Zags have never been a five seed. This is the first time in program history they have gotten an actual five seed. They were a six seed back in 2002. They were a four seed in 2009 and again in 2018 when they lost that nine-seeded Florida State team. They have been a four or higher 12 times, including each of the last six seasons, and they have been a six or lower 13 times, only twice since 2014. So to put that into perspective, basically Gonzaga earning a five seed is just right in the middle of the success that they have had in Mark Few's tenure. The last 25 years, earning a five seed is like the exact middle point, which first of all is just an incredible accomplishment for a mid-major program to average getting a five seed over a 25 year period of time. But it also is highlighted by the fact that their average in the last half decade is much better than a five seed. That's why Gonzaga earning a five seed this year, which frankly nobody expected. The expectation was a six or a seven, but that puts into perspective that this is kind of what Gonzaga does, and that's just a crazy fact when you really think about it. Well, St. Mary's, they also earned a five seed, and they had a huge, that's a huge, huge show of respect for the WCC by the Selection Sunday Committee. Meanwhile, BYU fans seething, seething mad that they got to watch Gonzaga and St. Mary's play on the five line while they're playing as a six seed. We're going to chuckle about that and talk more about the rest of the bracket. Coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Nissan. Folks, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that just stands out, a team that pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. This week, it's Iowa State, the Cyclones, obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team surprised us all with a dominating performance against Houston in the Big 12 championship game. They beat the number one team by 28 points to lock up a Big 12 tournament championship. Go Rogue! And that is exactly what TJ Otzelberger and the Cyclones have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Folks, Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides you access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or opening weekend for baseball, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. We have Fire Amazon Fire TV sticks on literally every single TV in our house because we love the layout, the user experience, and even the remote. It's super handy. It has little buttons that take you directly to Prime, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, and Hulu. Those are pretty much the four channels I'm going to when I'm not watching college basketball games. Uh, the Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big, big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep you up to date on the latest world of sports. So check out Fire TV channels on Amazon Fire TV and Alexa devices. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. All right, folks, segment two here. Still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags podcast, and we are still reeling. From Gonzaga getting a five seed in the 2024 NCAA tournament where they will start their their quest for a national title or at least to continue that Sweet 16 streak uh, in Salt Lake City against McNeese State. Again, the game will be on Thursday. Do not know the time. But what I want to do now is instead of looking just at the Midwest region, which we covered there in the first segment, and we'll cover more in detail in future episodes, but... I want to talk about some of the other results we saw uh, with teams that Gonzaga has played this year, teams Gonzaga is familiar with, what it all means uh, for those squads. And we'll start with St. Mary's because when the bracket was first revealed, for those of you who are checking it out, we did a live reaction to the bracket on Locked On College Basketball. If you want to see my live reaction to finding out that Gonzaga got a five seed, it is available. Go to the Locked On College Basketball YouTube channel, click on it. It's about 35, 40 minutes in. Uh, that is me reacting live to Gonzaga getting a five seed. And my first thought was 
what does this mean for St. Mary's? Because we hadn't seen them come up yet. And I just had a hard time imagining that they would put both these teams on the five line. And I thought St. Mary's going to get a six seed. Gonzaga's going to get a five seed. And that doesn't even feel right. Like that feels incorrect. And yet a few minutes later, St. Mary's, they also get a five seed. And they get a five seed where they get to play in Spokane, Washington. Maybe not their favorite place to play, at least a place they're familiar with. They're playing another West Coast school. They're playing Grand Canyon. Bryce Drew and the Antelopes, very, very good program out of the WAC. They're consistently excellent coming out of that conference. They've had a lot of success uh, in the last couple of years. And I think they're going to – Gonzaga obviously played them last year in the NCAA tournament. So now Grand Canyon gets a chance to play both of the WCC powerhouses as a team that is hoping to eventually be in the WCC. I know that that's their goal, and that's a conversation that we will likely have a handful of times over the offseason of uh, talking about realignment and what that could mean for the Lopes. But that's a fun draw for those two teams. I don't love mid-major teams being matched up. Uh, all that often, but I think this one is is, is totally fine. Uh, you, there's not going to be a lot of power six teams on the 12 line anyway, so I think this works out well for St. Mary's and Grand Canyon. And the winner of this game, if it is St. Mary's, they get a chance to play Alabama. And that's a unique matchup because Alabama is one of the best offensive teams in the entire country, but they are horrendous on defense. Absolutely awful on that end of the floor. Meanwhile, St. Mary's, very, very good defensive team, should be able to, to stymie Alabama more than many teams can. St. Mary's is also a very good offensive team. Would not shock me if St. Mary's does advance past Grand Canyon if they could give Alabama some serious trouble in that matchup. While we talked about the respect given to the WCC by the committee, both these teams getting five seeds is an indication that they believe in the WCC. We knew there was not going to be any other at-large hope. San Francisco's were long crushed. They lost to Grand Canyon, among other teams, in the non-conference. But I think it's a good indication of, of, of the viewpoint that they have, at least of these two teams. And to an extent, a byproduct of that is, is the value of the WCC. But more fun than all of that is the fact that BYU, who was consistently ahead of both Gonzaga and St. Mary's in the metrics, in the net, Ken Palm rankings, obviously joining a, a superior conference to the WCC in the Big 12. BYU fans love to let you know about that. That is kind of the MO there is kind of uh, thumb in their nose a little bit at the WCC after leaving of like, oh, well, we didn't want to be in that conference anyway. Well, you never won it. And now after having a, a successful season in the Big 12, you got to succeed. Still not as high of a seed as Gonzaga or St. Mary's. I got to chuckle out of that. I think it's probably a fine seed for BYU, but I do suspect there is a large subset of that Cougars population that is upset to see both the WCC schools get a higher seed than them in the NCAA tournament. BYU's got it. They're taking on the A-10 auto, auto bid winner, Duquesne, the Dukes, not expected to be an NCAA tournament team, but they went on a run, won the Atlantic 10 conference. I will be interesting to see if BYU can make a little bit of a run themselves. Uh, after a successful first season in the Big 12. A couple other things I want to talk about. Long Beach State, what a story. What a story. If you missed this story, folks, Dan Monson, of course, a longtime head coach uh, at Long Beach State, has been there for 17 years, was the architect of the 1999 Gonzaga team that went on the Cinderella run. The slipper still fits. He was the head coach. He bounced after that year to Minnesota. Mark Few took over. The rest is history. Monson got let go by the 49ers of Long Beach State again after 17 years. They fired him before the Big West tournament, but told him, hey, keep coaching. And he did. And he kept coaching them all the way to a Big West tournament championship. He coached them all the way to a 15 seed in the NCAA tournament where they're going to take on Arizona. Tommy Lloyd versus Dan Munson is going to happen. That's going to be the matchup. And it's a matchup where one of the coaches has already lost his job. Just complete insanity that that is what went down. It looks really bad for Long Beach State. This is the first NCAA tournament run for this program since 2012. There was a phenomenal quote by Dan Munson after the game. I'm going to read it here. It was tweeted by the great Brenna Green. Uh, here's Munson's quote. When Jim Harbaugh says, who's got it better than him? Someone's got to tell him Dan Munson. And then he, he went on to say later, I have the 1999 run at Gonzaga, but as Mark Few said over text, why don't we have a run in the first year and a run in the last? Let's see if Dan Munson can do something stunning. Beat Arizona would be their second time in a row losing as a two seed to a 15 seed would look very bad for Tommy Lloyd. Not that we want to see that, but man, it'd be fun to see Dan Munson get to go on a run in his final year. He said he doesn't think it's his last year. He wants to keep coaching. Makes me wonder if we could have a full circle moment. There's no open jobs on Gonzaga's coaching staff, but if Munson's looking for a gig, the Zags would find a way to find him a job. 
Rest of the Zags, opponents, Kentucky earned a three seed in the South region. A bit of a surprise they got up to that, but they played well down the stretch, picked up some big wins. Yale, Gonzaga beat Yale at the first game of the season. They earned the auto bid in the Ivy League on a game winner from Matt Noling. That was a fun, kind of one of the final few games before the, uh, the Selection Sunday show. Uh, they beat Brown, who made a surprise run to the Ivy League title game. Uh, Yale earns a 13 seed against Auburn. They're also playing in Spokane. So the teams that Gonzaga beat in the NCAA tournament or who are in the NCAA tournament, two of them, St. Mary's and Yale, will end up playing in Spokane. San Diego State's a five seed. They're also playing in Spokane. Feels like a lot of teams that Gonzaga has connections with are ending up in Spokane this year. They're taking on University of Alabama, Birmingham, the auto bid winner in the AAC. UConn and Purdue, both one seeds, no surprise there. Uh, the rest of Gonzaga schedule, nobody else making the dance. No UW, no USC, no UCLA, no Syracuse, none of the other teams for Gonzaga, but they did play a handful of teams in this dance, had a pretty solid record against them, all things considered. One of the things we were looking at coming into this, this tournament was whether a pair of former Zags in Wake, in, excuse me, in Hunter Salas and Efton Reed at Wake Forest, whether they would make the big dance. They lost early in the ACC tournament, which kind of pushed them to like the very back end of the bubble. They were only going to sneak in if there was no bid thieves whatsoever and if the committee happened to pick them over somebody else. That is not what happened. We had four bid thieves, Oregon, NC State, UAB, and Duquesne all won their conference tournaments and were not going to go dancing otherwise. That pushed a bunch of teams out of the field, including Wake Forest. Hunter Salas does not get to go dancing this year. Might be his final year if he ends up deciding to go pro. Uh, also, some surprising teams left out. St. John's, Providence, Seton Hall. We only got three teams out of the Big East that went dancing. Of course, that's UConn, Marquette, and Creighton. Uh, all three of those Big East teams were on the bubble, but again... When you have four bid thieves at the last possible moment, it kind of makes it hard to sneak those teams into the big dance. Another fun wrinkle, uh, New Mexico may not have made the NCAA tournament had they not beat San Diego State in the Mountain West Conference Tournament Championship. So when that happened and New Mexico secured a spot in the big dance, you could argue that that spot knocked out St. John's. And the reason that's notable is that New Mexico's head coach, Richard Patino, is the young is the son of St. John's head coach and college basketball legend Rick Pitino. So it is possible, and again, it's never going to be fully proven, but you can make the argument that Richard Pitino knocked his dad's team out of the NCAA tournament by winning that conference tournament championship in the Mountain West. Well, for now, we're going to put pause on the conversations about the NCAA tournament. We're going to be back on Tuesday with more discussion about this field, about Gonzaga's spot in it, what they need to do. We'll also, of course, get you an update on the women's basketball racket, which is coming out on Monday. But for right now, to close out the show, Gonzaga's already on the phone. They're already calling transfer portal players, including a, play, a pair of mid-major stars who could be really excellent fits in Spokane next season. More on that after a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. Folks, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster, and they do it for free. Thankfully, LinkedIn is not just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals, making it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you cannot find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process both easy and intuitive. Hiring is super easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and they may not have the time or the resources to hire. So they're constantly finding ways to make the process even easier. For example, they just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, folks, closing out the show today. Just like the Gonzaga coaching staff, they're prepping. They're getting ready. Who is McNeese? Who's Will Wade? Who are the players to look for? What does the rest of this region look like? What do we need to do? Meanwhile, somebody on staff, multiple somebodies potentially, they're working the phones. They're checking the transfer portal. They're finding out who's entering. It's official. On Monday, as many of you are listening to this, the transfer portal is officially open. Prior to this, it has been unofficial, but the Zags have been contacting players. We have two known targets, according to tweets from multiple different accounts. Joe Tipton at On3 tweeted about it, 24-7 High School Hoops tweeted about one of them as well, that have been in contact with recruits or with transfers. We're going to talk about the two transfers, but before we do that, I want to acknowledge this, and I'm sure this is going to come up again and again and again. 
The language is important because heard from is typically what we hear. This is the list of teams that this player has heard from, and it is the player reporting it. So Jacob Cruz at UT Martin, who we're going to talk about momentarily, reported to Joe Tipton that these schools have contacted him. The in, intent behind that contact is unknown. There is a massive difference between Mark Few calling a player individually or FaceTiming a guy and saying, hey, this is the role we identify for you. We'd like you to come in and start at the three. Uh, this is, you know, here are players who've come into this program in the past and had this kind of success. We think you could be a Byron Wesley type, a Jordan Matthews type, whatever it may be, versus Stephen Gentry or somebody else on staff or RJ Barsh, whomever it may be, uh, texting a kid and saying, hey, uh, saw you're in the transfer portal, good looking out, or, you know, we'll keep an eye on you or something like that. Those are both heard from. They both qualify, but they are very different. I don't know, unless we're told otherwise, we don't know what the extent of that contact is. What we do know is a player is going to pick the very best schools who have made any contact with him and put them on a list. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? If Gonzaga contacts you, if, if so-and-so contacts you and it's a program that makes you look really good, you're going to tell Joe that. You're going to tell somebody that, and they're going to promote it because it makes you look better. I mean, it's not lying. I assume it's not lying, but it's it's an important context to have. Here are the two players that have reported that they were heard from Gonzaga so far in this transfer portal season. Already mentioned Jacob Cruz. He is a six foot seven guard from UT Martin. He's got one year of college basketball eligibility remaining, and he dominated for UT Martin last year. 19 points, eight boards, one assist, shot about 42% from three. The previous year, he was at a junior college, Daytona State. The two years prior to that, he was in the Atlantic Sun Conference at North Florida, and he didn't do much of anything. Two combined seasons at North Florida averaged four points, two boards, shot 28% from three, uh, 12 and a half minutes per game. So a guy who's had one explosive breakout season at the mid-major level, but it was a really, really good year. Here is the list of schools that Jacob Cruz has reported. Kansas State, UCLA, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Virginia Tech, Auburn, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Mizzou, Georgia, North Carolina State, LSU, Illinois, Cal, Marshall, UAB, New Mexico State, and Wisconsin. So again, that's a lot of programs. And I suspect that the interest from some of those programs is significantly more than the interest from some of those other programs. So you take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Having said that, very talented young man. Marcus Foster from Furman is the other name here that has been connected to Gonzaga. Six foot four guard, also one year remaining. Notable that the two players Gonzaga is targeting are both guys with only one year of eligibility left. Uh, he spent five years at Furman. He redshirted in the 2019-20 season, so he only played for four years. Got one more year of eligibility because that first year was that COVID year. Last year, 17.7 and a half boards. Again, it's a six foot four guard, 1.8 assists, one steal. Shot about 56% on two pointers, only about 30% on three pointers on about seven attempts per game. However, he was over 35% in each of the last two previous seasons prior to last year. His list is much smaller Indiana, Arkansas. They're going to be on just about every one of these lists. Eric Musselman loves the transfer portal and he hated his team this last year. So he's going to be replacing just about everybody. Texas Tech. Xavier and Dartmouth on the list here as well. We already kind of gave the caveat about what heard from means, but the other caveat I'll give here is we don't really know Gonzaga's plan this offseason. They're going to be connected to a lot of players because of what I just said. Any contact they made is probably going to get reported, but they only have one player for sure departing the program. That's, of course, Anton Watson, who is out of college basketball eligibility. They have multiple scholarships, so they, they can bring in more than one player if they want to. But if they don't have rotation spots, who are they going to get in the portal? I think this is an important thing to acknowledge here. Assuming nobody else leaves, and that is the operating assumption right now. Mark Few may be operating with a different assumption if he knows that somebody is planning to leave, but we're operating under the assumption that only Anton Watson is leaving. That means next year's starting lineup is probably Graham E.K., Ben Gregg, Steele Venters, Nolan Hickman, and Ryan Nemhard. You can make an argument that Strummer starts over Venters, but either way, that's your starting five with either Venters or Stromer off the bench, Braden Huff coming off the bench. You also have Luka Krinovic, Jun Sukyo, and Pavle Stosic. Where is there a lot of playing time available? There's not. I think a third guard who could probably keep Luka in more of a fourth guard role where I think he's probably a little bit better suited right now just because of how much time he missed last season. A Gino Crandall, Aaron Cook type, great. These two players in particular for Gonzaga are senior guards. 
which I think makes sense. They come in for one year, they play a third guard role, they graduate. By that point, you're bringing in 2025 prospects. Hopefully Isaiah Harwell's coming in. Krinovich can take on a bigger role, et cetera. That to me makes sense. I'm not sure where else there's spots though. Because if Greg's stepping, I mean, he's been starting, but if he's going to be kind of filling that Anton role, Braden's going to fill a bigger role. It depends on Yo. If they feel Yo's ready to take on a bigger role, there's just not a lot of room. So I think you have to keep that in mind. If Gonzaga's missing out on big name transfers, it's probably because they're not getting promised the amount of playing time at Gonzaga that they would want. We'll see how this shakes out. If Gonzaga's really hammering certain specific positions, that's notable. Maybe they think somebody's going to leave. Maybe they think there's a deficiency on the roster that they can fix. But by and large, Gonzaga's roster is not built to take on a lot of transfer portal equity this year. So while we're going to talk a lot about the players they're pursuing, the names they're considering, the, the players that are reporting they've heard from Gonzaga. We're going to talk about it because that's what the offseason news cycle looks like. But ultimately, I don't think there's going to be a ton of actual action in the transfer portal from Gonzaga this season. Thanks again. And until next time, especially after earning a major, major boost with that five seed, go Zags.